Are you a brew head? I'm a brew head. Are you a brew head? I'm a brew head. Y'all a brew heads? Yeah, we brew heads. So pour a glass of craft beer, we can do this. Yeah. What's good, y'all? This is C Certified Brewhead. Welcome to episode 107 of Beer and Other Podcast Adjunct Series. This is a fantastic one, guys. This is something different that we've been planning for, I want to say, uh, like four months. It was before we moved and everything kind of got, uh, you know, thrown out of whack. But we finally made it happen. So you guys will be familiar with um, the two guests tonight. They've both been on the pod a bunch of times before. We'll talk about that where you can find more information. But Tonight, uh, if you want to learn something about craft beer, then you're in the right place. So I'm very excited to please welcome, guys, Max from Brasserie General and Noah from Beerism. In- oh! yeah, the, uh- Everybody good? Yeah, yourself. Yeah. Might better to see. Uh, better now I see your sexy faces. If I'm really honest. Well, they are beautiful. I'm not going to lie. They are. Um, Guys, genuine pleasure. Um, We had an idea to do this pod back in probably, it was probably like June or something. Um, So it has been a while, but it's it's something that I've wanted to learn more about personally and something that you guys did a fantastic collab, um, which is hilarious that you did it right in the middle of the summer, like a a big boozy stout collab. I love it because everyone in Quebec doesn't give a fuck. They're drinking stouts year-round, mate. They're not scared. It's beautiful. Um, so we're definitely going to be... Tonight, we're going to be talking about the art of blending beer, which I would say we've touched on in the past, but we've never done a full episode just dedicated to it. And uh, obviously, Max at Brasserie General in Quebec City, um, or BG, I'm sorry now, uh, you guys have been have a uh, have had a barrel program for many years i would probably imagine since the beginning would that be accurate yeah almost uh, i think we, we began the you know uh, aged beer in, in oak barrels the, the second year of operation so Jeez. maybe it's, it's doing like seven to eight years now Damn, and I, I, I was not there and the the, the guys at, at bg were already doing it uh, so it's been it's been a while Okay, so it's basically in the DNA of the brewery, essentially, to be uh, to be blending beer, um, and the stuff that you guys, I mean, Noah would echo my sentiments, I imagine here, but I feel like you guys are doing some of the best um, blended beer in the province, if not the country, as far as whether it's the stouts or whether it's um, the sours or the saisons or farmhouse ales. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Noah. I just think you guys were the first people. Obviously, you did the collab with Noah, so that's why we wanted to talk. To to you specifically, Max, about it, but at the same to- token, I really feel like you know no biases. Obviously, we've worked with you guys a lot with a bunch of collabs that uh, sit proudly on the shelf behind me here. Um, so, I, I don't know. T- tell me what you think, Noah. Why why are BG so uh, killer at this stuff? What's going on? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there is, I think, a history of it in Quebec over the last like 10 years or so with Dunham doing their early barrel age blends and even like I think oval blends and stuff but um, I feel like where BG's kind of been nailing it for the last couple of years is um, creating these funk forward like balance not overly acidic like just well done um blended sours and uh, now more they're playing with the the stouts and the different barrels and you know that's kind of how blendism was was birthed and uh i don't know everything i've had from you guys have been fantastic so i was really excited to be a part of that very cool thanks i'm very keen to talk about that there was one beer that we we actually had it uh, all together i think it was from your anniversary it would have either been last year or the year before called calculon um, which is exceptional. Yeah. And Max, you were just saying before, because I was like, should I go get the bottle to show it? Because I kept one because you told me to. And um, you were like, it's going for like, it's going bonkers on the trading market right now for that beer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think for us, the Calculon was the, the game changer. Uh, we were we were blending like a lot of, uh, uh, a couple of beers before, but we, we were more focused on uh, doing a beer and like, 
multi barrels of that beer and blending them together. But I think Calculon was the first one that we decided to, uh, uh, we were cherry picking from different barrels to make the best blend possible. And it was a game changer for us. Uh, we, we, I think we launched the beer for our seventh anniversary uh, two years ago. And this one, you know, was marking like a change of image and a change of philosophy for us. So uh, it was a it's, a, it's a really good beer, and we'll do it. We will be doing it again, but you know, it takes time, and we don't have the, the, the biggest barrel age program. So to reproduce the same beer, uh, I will explain it later. But it's kind of hard. To, to, to do the, the beer like twice like almost the same uh, almost hmm. the same beer so interesting definitely want to get into that that's that's fascinating um, so we should definitely get into the beers we're going to be drinking two beers tonight because they're both large in size and in uh, alcohol volume um, we're not going to be going into BG's history because we have done that before so go check out the other episode to learn more about Max it was uh, Max Pierre Hugo Noah and I did that chat I think it would have been for the two year anniversary. And then uh, Max, Tiff, and I chatted a few months ago uh, when uh, BG kicked off Link Up Series 3 with the Fire Sour, um, which was great. So, you know, we've got a bunch of BG content on there. So if you want to learn more about the brewery, please go do that. And obviously Noah's been on here 850 times. So uh, <laughs> definitely listen for him. So, Wigan, well, uh, yes. what, was the, what was the Link Up collab again? Uh, it was or, a... Or yeah, tell us about it, Max. I have it here. Yeah. So we're, it was uh, like a fruited sour, uh, fruited hoppy sour, uh, maybe okay. raspberries, uh, uh, I think blackberries, and marshmallow and blueberries, and that kind of stuff. Marshmallow uh, and lactose. When, no, when, when you when, when you read the description, you kind of uh, you kind of think that this beer is going to be like oh heavy or like crazy stuff but it was actually well balanced it worked out. so easy easy drinking for the alcohol and all the stuff that were put into it and a lot but of food the... and just the, the good amount of hops and you know i remember doing the podcast and i think i had like three cans and i was like okay <laughs> i kind of feel it after after war but you know it, it was so easy drinking it's dangerous uh, but this way it was our version of the link up Yes, seven point seven percent Noah. So it's a, it was a big sour. Seven point seven. Yeah, it was it was great. Uh, it was perfect though because it was, was it the first... in the realm of like uh, half hours on Earth kind of pastry sour mm, thing. I can see that. That's a that's a fair comparison. Um, it didn't feel because like half hours always felt like zany and like whoa ridiculous like on mm -hmm. paper this looks maybe more like that but it, it really like it just worked it was super smooth it was more it was balanced very balanced super balanced um really smooth like on like it looked like it could be a smoothie or something and just really deep kind of ready purple um the the marshmallow just gave like a touch of vanilla so it was nothing like super intense or anything so that might turn you know people would be like what the fuck if they're not used to seeing pastry with sours or smoothies or whatever but um well they were kind of like yeah. a short-lived thing they're not quite as popular right now smoothie sours uh, i'd say like pastry or oh, pastry sours. sours that's fair pastry sour yeah uh, i mean I have no, a it's guy not a critique or whatever it's just a it doesn't seem to be as popular as it was like last year or the year before that's I mean, it, it sounds so much hype. I mean, like pastry sours, yeah. two, two, two hype style blend together. Uh, I had a couple of good example of great beer, really. But, uh, you know, it's kind of, I don't think that style will last very long. Or no, I, I think exactly. it just passed on the radar and that kind of yeah. stuff. But yeah. This um, year was the year of lagers. So. It sure was. <laughs> God sure. damn it. Hopefully every year is the year of lagers. Um, but uh, we, should, we should talk about lager blending. That would be interesting too. So we're kicking off with this beautiful grisette called Clémence. It is a uh, a grisette with uh, clementines, I believe. Uh, Max, is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, what does this word polygraminé? What does that mean? <laughs> it's just I, I like to uh, to do the description of the product and polygraminé is like 
just basically uh, multi-grain. Multi-grain? Ah. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, multi-grain, but it sounds so much fun. I mean, polygraminate is like just... It sounds great, so I just want to put it on the label. And I respect see it. People, people react. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I love it. Um, this is like a perfect I, one. Yeah, go, Max. Yeah, actually, I think you guys have the the, the, the first batch, uh, and I am drinking the, the the latest one because we we just uh, we did it again uh, like recently, like three weeks ago. Okay. We, uh, we put the Clemence B2 on sale. So, uh, th this project, it, it evolved uh, really fast. And I'm expecting a little, bit, a little bit more fruit in my glass than yours at this point. Because uh, the, the, the first batch was uh, launched, I think, in June or May. So that about right. already, uh, already a couple months. But it's a fantastic. Um, so, what does the from a from a, a flavor profile in the nose and in the the palate? What does the amarone lend to the, the beer? I, I'm not super familiar with that. With that, is is that an almond based liqueur amarone, or am I completely lost? No, I'm a, I'm a run. I, uh, if I'm if I'm right, you know, I don't want to say something wrong, but. I think it's a, an Italian red wine, which is supposed to be more yeah. uh, sweet. But uh, or the, the barrel we did get, we, we had we had flavors of the, the, the from the wood, and from the, the, the freshly emptied uh, wine. But we, we didn't get much uh, like uh, a really an intense flavor. It was more like uh, more subtle, more fruity, more a bit like cherry or or um, I noticed some uh, I don't want to call it in English but it's uh, it's lila uh, so some some flower um, oh lilac fresh maybe? lila yeah so I'll see the, the, the translation but it's more like flower and cherry and oh, a little okay. bit sweet but the the the, the, the barrel we we work with um, it's called Poncio, and it's like twice and half the, the size of regular barrels. So it's hmm. uh, it's like four, uh, it's like five five hundred liters barrels. So there there is less uh, wood contact, mm -hmm. and so it's it's more subtle than a smaller barrel where, where we get uh, a lot of wood contact and more intense flavor from the wood and from the, the previous liquid that were into the barrel. Hmm. Um, the, the, the Clemence one is, is a blend of, it's a good example of what we, uh, we want to do uh, a little bit more often right now. It's like blending uh, old and new beers together uh, because we, we, we are looking to get Oh more complexity and uh, a, a really uh, like uh, thirst quenching like beer. So the grisette is the, the perfect example for uh, for yeah. that uh, the type of exercise. And this one we, we just blend like uh, uh, like maybe ten percent of uh, gin barrel age uh, beer, like fifty uh, forty or fifty percent in uh, in Amaron, and we blend it and we back blend it. With a fresh, a fresh grisette that that was in stainless for three weeks, so we just did the the beer, the base beer, and we put it on like on Clementine. So we just let it dry for a couple of days, and so basically the beer, uh, the maximum age beer in, in this product was like six months. This is the the gin one. And the the, the Amaron barrel age was, was like three months, and then the fresh beer, and then ten days on on the Clementine. So ten days. Okay. What's the second one? Sorry, the um, what kind of barrels? Uh, the main one is the the the, the Amaron. Amaron. Uh, Ama Amaron. Yeah. A M A R O N. I've never heard of that. 
Yeah, with an E at the end. Label at the moment. So, yeah. Oh, it is? I was looking for it, but I couldn't see the thing. <laughs> Demeron. Oh, Demeron. Okay, my bad. Well, that's, yeah, uh, no, it's Emeron. Emeron, yeah. Okay, with an E. Okay, cool, cool. And what is that? What is Emeron? Yeah, it's, uh, it's an if, Italian if right, rich it's red a, wine. Red wine. Exactly. Um, this is uh, exceptional. Um, um, the the like I know you said yours is fruitier, but this is super fruity, man. This nose is crazy. Like it's so it's, intense. Uh, it's amazing. I love this beer. I was lucky enough to have a second bottle, <clears throat> and. I'm assuming. How did you do the fruit edition? Was it was it skins and juice, or just did you literally just throw them in there or chop them up? And like, how did you do the fruit component? Yeah, uh, I think we just went to the Costco. Uh, we just bought a couple boxes. Uh, we, we filled like two cars with the boxes of clementine from the Costco, and we That's just amazing. Uh, and our staff just split it in half, press the juice, and then put it all together into a, uh, a stainless, uh, you know, a stainless vessel that we use to uh, we use to blend our beer. So basically, it's just a square, like fermenter, with uh, with a screen uh, at the end. So. Another we can one. put a lot of fruit, and with the screen, we just uh, we can extract the maximum of juice without putting out uh, like the, the whatever we put into it. So we just awesome. did the, the blend into that that vessel, and then we add the fruit and let it ride for a couple of days. That's so. It cool. has that. <clears throat> it has this pithy tannic. Component I was from, literally writing that word. <clears throat> but, DNA. like, I'm sure that's coming from mul multiple points, too, right? Like, the oak is going to have some tannins, probably. Um, and then you have the, 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 the clementines and the skins that just have that... It's not a... It's like... I wouldn't call it a tartness, but, yeah, I guess, like, a tartness that just, like, sucks the moisture out of your mouth. That, like, yes. Lovely. It's... Uh, and, and the fact that it's not a particularly acidic, I love because I think that's to the point that you were trying to get to before was that you wanted to make something drinkable and thirst quenching and not uh, intensely acidic that you can't even drink it or so you have to like sip on it all day. Like you could down this bottle pretty easily. Oh yeah, I will. I will. Yeah, I did it uh, alone a couple times. So a big bottle is yeah. no, it's not a problem with that type of product. It's so so easy going, and uh, sometimes you, you see those big bottles and you are scared. I mean, like oh shit, I have to invite a friend or to share it or whatever. Yeah. But with this one, you know, <laughs> there's no worries that you can drink it alone. And, you know, it's, it's just like four percent alcohol and so so easy going. So yeah, which is awesome. The do you want to maybe give us some of the other tasting notes that uh, we're getting from this? And then, because that might give people a bit of an idea of like what can come, like Noel was saying, from the different barrels and from different elements of this whole process, whether it's fruit or the bugs or whatever. And then we can get yeah. started on how blending works. So yeah, maybe is there any other tasting notes that you're getting in this beer? Uh, in mine, uh, because it, it's fresher, so... Uh, the, the, uh, the the yeast and you know uh, lactic bacteria uh, ain't got time to to uh, you know to um, to do some work into the bottle, so uh, mine is more fruity and more maybe maybe a little bit more sweet because uh, from the version you guys have uh, I drink one like uh, the, a month ago and the fruit tend to like disappear a little bit and tend to gain a little bit of acidity and more woody hmm. would uh, would have you know some woody notes uh, but this one is really like zesty fruity a uh, low uh, with low acidity and with uh, like a dry body 
and the sh like the, the sugar uh, perception came from the from the fruit fruit note mm. and uh, maybe the the, the amaran and the uh, the little part of gin barrel age that we put into the beer so it, it just tend to support and to uh, you know to extend the, the the fruit sensation on a light body and light flavors so it's it's, it's really easy is is it drinkable and it's also complex so this is what is so beautiful with you know with grisette uh, i mean it's a style that you know allows that to have a low alcohol beer a little bit of wood a little bit of acidity and whatever uh, aromas you get from it so those are such beautiful beers mm. every time i have a grisette i'm always like really? man i need to drink these more i feel like they're like there's like people who i noticed you know friends in quebec we have who like always talk about grisettes and I was like, you know, we always had the jokes the, about that and stuff. But every time I have a grisette, fuck, man, they're just so good. And and I feel like I don't think I've had many grisettes with like fruit additions. I feel like it's not incredibly common. Would that be accurate? Uh, yeah, I think it's not really common. But most most of the time, I think it was with uh, cherries or that kind of stuff. But the one with you know why we decide to do with clementine is just basically because uh it's a, a wonderful fruit uh when the season is right and yeah. I, you know I, I could just imagine that beer and i was like i, I have to do it like do it like in case that clementine it, it will be like wonderful and yeah. it is wonderful so uh, i really enjoy it because it's so so light yeah, man. it's interesting yeah. how like like clementines as a fruit have been had a, such an important part of my life like i don't know what's like in australia craig but mm. growing up here every christmas you, you know it was the crates of the, the clementines and you know we always had in the house and you could just eat them like candy because you can have like three or four of them in a row and it's or you, or you brought them to school and then your hens smell like this all day long um and so it's nice to have that in a beer because i don't think i've ever had a clementine beer and i don't know why it's tangerine everything yeah uh but not uh, clementine i think it's just I less common know. like it's not a year-round year fruit maybe that's why no exactly yeah because the, like like noah said you know the, there there's a season for for that fruit because if you bought it like maybe in june it will be like it will not taste good at all. It will taste like mm -hmm. you know cardboard or something really not nice. But when the season is right, you know, it's, it's so oh, it's such a beautiful fruit. Uh, the aromas are really intense and like you said, like candyish. Uh, it's oh, really good. So easy to peel. Yeah. It's just like but, it's like you can peel them baggy. in like one shot. Yeah, it's yeah. like ah, I rip yep. them. Where like a mandarin, you're like ah, fuck, come here. Yeah. Yeah. Forget that. Uh, so, what did you have? If you, what were you? If, if you Sorry. if you don't see it that often, it's because uh, most most of the fruit uh, that the brewery use are like in in, a, in form of puree, like free blended right. uh, fruit without anything, without the, the zest, without the, the the seeds, without anything. It's just like puree. So. Uh, I think it's why it's not that common, mm. but you know, we, we, we just decide to go, uh, like I said, at Costco because we know that all year rounds, those, those clementines are really good. And we just decide to go there and buy full boxes. Yeah. It worked beautiful, man. Um, yeah, this is yeah. a spectacular beer and I'm glad to be, uh, that we're doing this one tonight. So. Now we've sort of given you guys a bit of a picture of like this beer, which is like you said, you've done the second batch. So like Max alluded to earlier, we will come back to we're recreating a barrel aged beer because that's fascinating to me. Um, let's go through the process of creating a barrel aged beer and specifically on the blending, which I guess is really what we're, we're going to be talking about here. Do you want to maybe talk us through the process of how it get you know like of how it gets to the point to when you blend? So what are all the steps? You don't have to spend too long on it, but I imagine 
yeah, we just so people understand that how you know the way it gets to the blending point, and then we can go much more in depth about like the the approach, the different approaches to blending, you know, depending on what you want to actually achieve. Okay, uh, there, there's a lot to say about blending. Uh, I have to say that most information that I personally got are from books or discussion that I had with other brewers, and you know the best the best people that are blending for years uh, are the, the, the Belgian, the mm -hmm. Belgian goose producer and the, the, uh, the goose blenders. And, but goose is more like a, a, a wild beer. And I think the, the Americans developed the, the clean side of mm -hmm. barrel aging and blending with their stouts and scotch shell and uh, all that, all, all that kind of stuff. So they, they became, you know, experts. Uh, in, into this because basically with the, the with the bourbon barrel that you know in the law of bourbon you can use only once uh, the the the, um, the the American oak for for the bourbon so the the, bur the bourbonry bourbon distillery had to dispense of, of their uh, the, their American oak barrels after a couple of years and uh, so the brewery just you know kept putting putting them into the brewery and putting beer into it and then, you know, become expert of, of, uh, of, uh, barrel aging in with the clean side. So I think if we are talking about barrel aging and blending there, there, there is two sides. There is the, the, the wild side, which the Gizet is on, and there is the clean side, which the blendism is on. Hmm. So hmm. when we're talking about, um, the wild side is because uh, mostly there is some uh, Brettanomyces and Lactobacillus and Pedococcus into it, which are uh, considered as um, beer contaminants. So you don't you don't want those bacteria and yeast into normal beer, like commercial beers or uh, an imperial stuff. You don't you basically don't want that kind of stuff, but Sometimes uh, together they are really doing uh, great flavors and really intense, uh, you know, acidity or complex beers. But those things takes uh, a lot of times. And when you do like uh, dark beers that you know are aged in in the, in the, um, in spirits barrels like bourbon, whiskey, or rum, or gin, you, you don't want those bacteria at all because the beer would just get like a, a funky side or not not what you not, not what you want from that. Uh, and when we talk about blending, um, if I'm just focusing on the on the Clemence, uh, as I said, the maximum barrel aged beer that uh, we use into this one was the the gin uh, the gin gin barrel aged beer, which is like ten percent of the of the blend, and this one was aged for like six months, and it's it's not it's not that long, and most of the beer uh, uh, that were aged in Amavan uh, Amavan Ponchio, um, you know it it stay in contact with the wood for three months. And so this is a pretty young blend because we do uh, we do other blends that we had to to sit sit uh, we had, the beer had to sit there for like two years and a half and sometimes three three years and we back blend it with a year and a half beer and we put it into bottles and we just forget it for like six to eight months. And then we, we put it on the market. So sometimes there are that type of product that it can take like three years to to so so mm -hmm. you can drink it. So those are kind of two separate uh, two separate type of product. Even if both are wild, uh, you know there 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 is one which is more um, which is less complex and sometimes less intense and got less um, barrel aging time too and 
when you think about the clean side, you can do uh, you can forget your beer in bourbon barrel aid and and in bourbon for like six to twelve months to uh, sometimes some brewery are doing like thirty six months so three years basically mm. but the the most the most difficult thing that you you, um, you get with time is uh, how do you um, how do you keep you know the, the the barrel enough uh you know intact because with time the wood just dry out and there are some crack that are just uh there are some crack that just appears into the barrels and, and let the oxygen mm -hmm. into the beer or anything that can go into the beer like basically bugs or that kind of stuff so you have to throw away that, that barrel because it dry out and mm -hmm. the beer is not Enough, or it develop like a, a soy sauce uh, taste, so yeah. you, you don't want that. So uh, even if you're doing like uh, a clean, uh, clean barrel aged beer or uh, like a, a wild one, you have to keep the the, the temperature at uh, at the uh, you know uh, the the, the temperature constant, and you have to keep the humidity constant too. So this is why, like in wine, uh, when you see uh, uh, when, when you go to a, to a winery in France or in Italy or whatever, most of the barrels are on the ground into into caves, and because uh, the, the temperature is steady and the humidity is steady right there, so the barrel just kept getting like uh, you know intact. So this is a short story of. You know, barrel aging and you know, blending, and we could go uh, more into details. <laughs> okay. I was thinking so. Okay, so when you're going to make a beer, whether it's something clean or wild, you're brewing a beer with the intention that it's going into barrels for some time. So you brew the beer. Now, first question would be do you brew the beer differently? No, to say, say if you were making a grisette that was going to be just a clean grisette, no barrels, no bugs, nothing, just putting it in a can or putting it in a bottle and off it goes. Would you brew a, a beer intended for aging and then blending differently than you would for a beer that is not? Uh, yeah, for, for the grisette, I don't think uh, I'm doing, I'm not doing a different beer because... Uh, as as I told uh, told you, you know the 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 wood contact is is much shorter, so the beer mm -hmm. will be probably the, the same beer but more complex, and which is fun with Gizet is that they are already dry, and you put like a commercial yeast and uh, lactobacillus into it, and you let them co-ferment together, and you just let them ride into the barrel for couple of months uh, but you know in, in a short uh, short period of time so they, they they develop a certain complexity but not that much because uh, they basically did most of the work in in stainless steel so you know they, they did they did uh, more uh, you know more of the the, the, you know, the process in stainless the first three weeks and then after that the, the next three months will be you know more like uh, on a slow uh, slow scale with the wood contact and the oxygen but on the other on the other end if you brew like a, like a clean clean beer a big barrel age uh, imperial style double mash imperial style or or a past three one with lactose yeah you want to brew it like rougher because you know that it will spend at least six months into the barrels, uh, if not 12 or more. And the beer that you get, you know, in stainless, which is more rough and less, you know, less, let's say, clean, uh, will, will get clean with, in time, uh, in the time with, with the barrel, uh, with the time in, into the barrels. Like, you want to brew that beer knowing that you will get bourbon flavors and uh, American oak flavors 
and then some tannins. And so you brew the beer, you know, you taste it into the fermenter and you're like, okay, it's a bit rough, but you know, we'll see in 12 months. So you just put it in a barrel and then magic happens. I mean, if, if you brew a clean, a clean beer before the barrel age, it would just get intense or not, not that rough, uh, that much, you know, you won't appreciate it that much or it will lose complexity or it, it, it will just get, you know, it's like if the barrel is your friend or your enemy sometimes, because if you, the beer is too clean before, then the barrel will just, uh, will just eat the beer and then you, you will have a completely different beer at the end. Interesting. Could you expand a little bit on, not too much, but what's the difference between brewing it rough and brewing it clean? Like, what does that mean? I mean, uh, it's just like you. I, I, personally, uh, in my own experience, I, I like balanced beer. And right now, what we put into barrels uh, with, with dark beers like uh, Hobbes Porter or an Imperial style, that kind of that kind of stuff, tend to be more uh, more sugary, more uh, more sometimes more bitter, more alcoholic than before. Mm -hmm. uh, before we put it into the barrel and then it, it's getting uh, more complexity and more body and because before our philosophy was to do like the best all possible and then put it into barrel but if like i said if you get a, a well-balanced beer before putting it into the barrel you know it will get some more ingredient with time like the tannins and like the spirits so, and the, the when you work with uh, with bourbon like you want the, the you want the most uh, the most freshly emptied barrels because uh, this is where you get some flavors uh, the, the more flavors and if you get the more flavors you get more alcohol into it and then you lose some body uh, not some body but you lose <laughs> you lose body into the beer so. If you have a well balanced uh, the, the 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 right amount of sweetness into the beer, you would you would just lose that. The beer will will be drier at the finish, and more you will you know taste the tannin more and that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. you want you want it a little bit more uh, overly sweet to know that uh, when you know that in the end the beer will get you know uh, will be drier at the end. So. I get it. You want to do that before, hmm. before the process. That's yeah. also why certain beers age better than others in your cellar. Like if you taste a beer and it's it's got like this killer body, it's a little bit sweet, and it's got like an intense bitterness, mm -hmm. that's something you can sit on for a while because over time those things a little will mellow. taper. And if the beer doesn't have enough of that, and then it ages, then you have this thin thing and like it's just oxidized or not even if it just it's it's just a shadow of what it once was. Whereas in if the beer is that intense to begin with, it, it can last forever. Like I don't know if you guys remember um, Dunham's Imperial Stout, like their like the kind of, the one that they started with and then they did all these variants. That beer was it poured out like motor oil. It was unbelievably bitter and and but like crazy body and i've had that beer like four or five six years old and it, it just gets better like hmm. it's amazing interesting so then for both of you is like is it a given that a barrel aged beer being that it's spent time even though it's you know there's younger ones and older ones you know like you're saying the wild is typically a bit shorter Sometimes the stouts are a bit longer. Are they all inherently made for cellar aging after the fact? Or is, are like, would there be cases where a beer like we're drinking now, like the um, like a, a grisette with fruit, would this beer be made to be like, yeah, sit on that for another two years, it's going to be even better? Or like, is it? does it really depend? Like just because they've been in a barrel depends. doesn't mean, right? Yeah. Because I, I don't think this is going to get much better 
It might get a little bit more funky, but like I, I correct me if I'm wrong, Max, but I feel like this is kind of what you want it to be. Yeah, exactly, and those beer are low low ABVs too. So, right, uh, yeah. you know, alcohol is, is really important to into the process of aging hmm. because there are some factors that if, if someone you know is putting his bottle on the, on the contact top and you know the sunlight just strike the bottle, you know, it will gain some weird taste. But uh, oxygen uh, have a lot to do into the the aging beer. So prior to the, the aging process, the brewery have to make sure that, you know, there, there is no oxygen that, that is introduced into the product because it will like decrease uh, really rapidly with, with the time. Mm. But, uh, you know, there, there are some style that, you know, uh, support the aging like really well. So big multi beers, uh, which are less uh, sensitive to uh, to the oxygen, uh, and they, they tend to gain some complexity, uh, even if there is a low uh, low percentage of oxygen into it. So, which we call madère uh, madérisation. Uh, so it's like the, the the fruity notes that that develop with time, and the the, the beer is gaining like caramel toffee side. So this is a, a little bit. Uh, oxidation with time and you know for, for those uh, ex an example for the the style that Noah mentioned before uh, I remember uh, I had a few ones and they were pretty uh, like bitter and like like mm -hmm. when they they are young it's like it's, it's rough I mean it, it's, <laughs> yeah, I, I, <laughs> I like my style but you know not that not that rough but I, I have I have no doubt that you know with time you can you get more complexity, more like more sugary side that like, came backward, and and then the the bitterness tend to you know uh, decrease a little bit. So you get, mm -hmm. I mean, those beer must be wonderful. Mm. But yeah, but when we're talking about aging, uh, if it got fruits, you know, you have to drink it. My thing, yeah, between uh, within like twenty four months. Of course, okay. uh, even even the, the lambic producers, uh, which are doing like really fruity beers, like the the, the creek and uh, the, the kind of stuff with like uh, four hundred uh, gram per liters of cherries or raspberries or whatever, uh, they they told you like if you will, we put fruit because we want it to taste fruit, so drink it within twenty four months because otherwise it will become like lambic. Because mm -hmm. the beer evolved, all the bacteria and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Some of them survived through try through the time, and you know, they just continue to eat whatever they got. So the fruit is like the most uh, reliable food. So uh, if you you've got a, a fruit beer, drink it within a year or two, I think maximum. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, pastry style. I don't think they age really well. Mm. I think they should be like uh, considered the, the equivalent of fruit beers or even the IPAs of uh, barrel aging beers because when you put a lot of coconut and nuts and that kind of stuff into the beer, you know, those are the kind of ingredients that do not tolerate the, the, the oxygen with time and they just tend to get weird mm. like mm. wrenchy mm. or buttery or that kind of flavor that you don't want it to your beer mm. but yeah, yeah but, or they go away entirely and you kind of lose the whole point of them being there to begin with they fade fast i find like hops almost like yeah but like macadamia nuts like if it's fresh fresh you get that and then over time it just starts fading away mm. what about coffee stuff? Oh, that's coffee. a whole other conversation. Mm. Yeah. I think coffee is, is a word <laughs> apart. I mean, like the, the different, you know, different grain, different terrifaction. I mean, even, but, but coffee is not, it's not that much of a nutriment, but, you know, I think it aged really well. So mm. in the period style grew with coffee and even with vanilla, without lactose or that kind of stuff, it, it must age really well. 
Right. Okay, another question on that. I know we're supposed to be talking about blending, but the barrel aging is a good, like, segue into it. Um, if you guys want to open the stove? We can do it whenever yeah. you want. Whenever you want to get into it, fellas. Amazing. You want to do it now? Yeah, I'm done. Yeah, I, yeah, I just... Uh, I'm here for it. You guys are. Get me back. Um, oh, Max is going to get it. So, a question then. Yeah, no, I'll wait with you. Um, the... What was I going to say? The fucking... So, does... Say if it's a bourbon barrel. So, I'm thinking of, like, say, Peche or something, right? Like, I was texting you maybe, like, two weeks ago. I had a Peche bourbon barrel age one, and I was like, Jesus. And it was from last year. It wasn't super old. But I was like, this is brilliant. It's kind of perfect. Like, with, an, like, like, with, like, one extra year on it or two extra years, that's, like... Prime. Like money. So, yeah. when you guys were talking about, I have the lot like the sec this year's third moon. Um, they bar they did a bunch of they hit three barrel aids like pastry stouts essentially. One was a coffee one, but the other two were pastry, and they're wax like sealed. Each piece with the coffee. Each piece with coffee, and they did like a Nutella bestowed and a birthday yeah. cake bestowed barrel aid, bourbon barrel aid. Does a bourbon barrel age uh, offset? the limits placed on it by adjuncts, say for a pastry stout or a coffee stout. So say if coffee would drop, I know Max, you said different depends on the bean or, or, or the roast and all this type of shit. Um, and a pastry stout, like Noah, you were saying the, the macadamia or the coconut and all the different things can either disappear or taste weird. Does the bourbon barrel specifically offset those drops? Like, can it last longer because it's, um, bourbon barrel aids as opposed to uh if it was just a regular pastry stout and you just let it sit for a year or whatever the fuck and, and kind of ruined it i don't know what e e for either of you guys i um i feel like a, a while ago i would have thought I, I had an answer for that but i feel like my answer to that has changed because I've had a lot of Third Moon pastries, uh, and they're fine, but then the barrel aged stuff is on a whole other level, and it, like I was kind of under the impression that they were almost just like brewing a different beer for the barrels, but maybe they were, I don't know. But then also, with BG, I remember having... You have the, the, the one that's hazelnut, What what's that one, Max? In can or in bottles? In can? Bottles. Oh. Well, hazelnut. Your Nutella, the the one that that has, it's like a Nutella toast. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, this one is uh, it's called Delicessence. Uh, it's a collaboration yes. with, uh, with 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 Saint Pichet. Uh, so I remember we, we we did the you know we did the barrel age one, you know that. You know that that came up. Uh, I think it's, it was in June. We we launched the beer in June, but uh, this one was really different from the, from the can uh, version. Okay, so you brewed it differently for the no, barrel. No, no. Uh, I think the, the the base beer was the same, and okay. we did. So we, the barrel we did, yeah, we did the barrel aging, and then we added the, the adjuncts to it, because okay. uh, That's I am personally a, a bit you know, worried about uh, putting the beer with, like, uh, you know, with hazelnut and uh, coconut and yeah. whatever into it, and then put it into barrel for, like, um, for, like, 6 to 12 months. I mean... To me, it just means like oxidation, but mm. uh, this is this is me as brewer, and people can you know. No, but it totally makes sense. Different takes on because, that. Like, and even even if there if if the the adjunct didn't oxidize and get weird, it at the very least it would just not be that uh, not be very apparent anymore, especially like coconut or nuts or whatever, because like those flavors just fade away. So yeah, it totally makes sense to do it at the end. I didn't. That makes. Yeah, I get it now. Yeah, but you know, some, some breweries. Uh, I mean, we uh, we we plan on doing it, and we we haven't do it, done it yet. But you know, to control the temperature and the the humidity. I mean, if I'm a brewer and I control all those factors, 
Uh, I mean, maybe I will care less to let you know the coconut for like six months to the barrel, but you know, uh, I have more um, uh, fluctuation of temperature into the you know our room where we put the barrels, mm -hmm. so uh, this is why mostly I'm not you know, uh, I'm not putting things into the barrels uh, because. Uh, I was talking earlier about you know the, the the barrels that dry out and so there's oxygen that can get into the product and to uh, you know to to compense uh, you know uh, to prevent that we we put younger beer into the barrels so the barrels are always like full and full of liquid so it prevents uh, the barrel from from drying out. Mm -hmm. But uh, some, some breweries that control, you know, the, 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 the whole room, you know, the beer will, will evaporate, mm -hmm. but the, the humidity outside is at a perfect point, so the barrel don't dry out. So it's, it's really funny because the beer will, will like evaporate and will condensate a little bit, but the barrel will not dry out. So this is why the, that type of brewery can let their barrel for like 24 24 months to 26 months and they they get a lot of you know complex complexity for that and this is why you know i can't do that because uh, i i do not control uh perfectly you know the, the temperature or the humidity so i have to 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 have a different approach on that and on the, on the wild side, it's it's less uh, to to me it's less important uh, if you know I'm topping off my my barrels because I always kept them full, so I prevent you know them from drying drying out, and I just put some younger nutrients to the beer, so it's like it's like continuously like uh, it's getting nutrients, so the beer evolve. And I like it like that. Hmm. That's fascinating. So for, the bar the, for the barrel aging with ingredients, uh, you know, I haven't, I, I haven't tried it, and uh, I won't try it until I control uh, all the aspects. Amazing. I love that. That's fascinating, man. Yeah, step away two seconds. Yeah, man, you're good. Um, look, you look at my wires. I love your wires. Um, okay, that's that's very very cool, Max. I feel like we've talked to uh, like. I feel like the barrel aging part of it was actually a pretty important part of this conversation then because it's like the precursor to all of the blends and all of the things we've been talking about, I yeah. guess, if those things weren't considered such as brewing the beer rough because if, you know, if you don't, you do it too nice, then it's not going to age well. Um, you know, making sure that you don't, you put the adjuncts in later, like all of these things impact the next step which is the actual blending um it's this is really really fascinating um so the beer we're about to drink now is the collab uh the reason why this podcast came about was a collab between noah and uh so beerism and uh, bg called blendism um we can wait till noah comes back to talk about it but this is a pretty intense beer this is uh 11 percent it's a uh, a big I've got the English version here. Um, this is probably the first time you've ever had an English description on the can, on the, on the label, or have you done that before? Yeah, and this one's pretty fun because, uh, you know, it was a, a mistake, like the description. You know, I uh, the whole thing, the whole point was like to let Noah describe the beer and to do like a, a really short French version, like saying like, uh, oh, it's all English. Barrel aged style blending beer, and like <laughs> maybe laughing of Noah on, on, on the way because you know, it, yeah, this guy has you know so much words to put to like aromas and uh, when he described a beer. And you know, I was, uh, I wanted to, to maybe make it make a joke about that, but you know, it didn't came up like on the label because. The description was like too long, <laughs> so this is why I let you know the, the whole description really in English to take the place of the blendism, and uh, I just want to, to make it 
uh, to make a short French version, but uh, there was no, no room. I, 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 I didn't. <laughs> Are you talking about people. the label? <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about the description and how I let you, you know, describe the beer. And I just want to do like uh, one sentence in French that said like Bourbon Barrel Age Barrel Age Stout. <laughs> just 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 for a laugh and but I didn't have space so just an English version. <laughs> it was even funnier. Yeah. I was so surprised you did that, but uh, I love it. Thank you. It's uh, it, it's classic. I thought the top part was uh, French, so I just read the bottom part. And then as Max was talking about, it's like, oh shit! Like it, the whole thing's in English. That's the whole hilarious. thing is just. <laughs> Like technically, if you were selling that in the, uh, did you did it get distribute uh, distribution at all, or was it? Um... Uh, I think it get a little Some bit of stores. distribution. Okay. Yeah, like a couple, was that like uh, an ad? couple, couple of stores. We we like to do that. We like to do uh, to sell it, you know, on site. Uh, most of most of the beer, and then uh, with you know the the uh, our partner, our best partners, we we, we just offer them uh, a box if they want. And I think this one like got like was di distributed in like twenty different places, but that was it. They they all all get like one box and and that's like, it. Just like like uh, like we said, thank you, thank you for su supporting uh, supporting us all all year round. So it's a box of uh, okay, of case of our blending stuff. Okay, I uh, I, have an, I have an idea for you, man. I mean, for the next podcast, maybe you could uh, do a whole session about the day waxing a beer. Like, let's do it. To use. <laughs> I mean, oh no, shit! Got, they, they, everybody. This got is what I'm going to use. Different technique. Oh, oh damn! <laughs> All right, relax, relax, dab man. Noah's been just lighting up nails. That's what he's up to. Cheers. Look, okay. Cheers, guys. Yes. Cheers. Got the uh, official glassware there. Oh. Look at that. You know the vibes, sexy. Mr. Forrest. Cheers. Cheers, boys. Oof. His nose is straight bourbon and dark chocolate. Have you had this before, Craig? Yeah. So, you uh, remember we met up uh, at... Um, oh, right. What was the place called? Fuck. You know what I'm talking about. We went to Belgao. For that uh, event, oh, and um, yeah, yeah, yeah. you you linked me a bottle, and I wanted to make sure I reviewed it while it was still um, around, mm -hmm. and then we did it for this. So I have had this before. I I drank it on my non-drinking nights on Wednesdays, where I only drink big beers. <laughs> um, I probably won't drink all of this tonight. I got a little stopper. I'm going to finish this tomorrow. But um, so j just to exactly explain what this one is, and then I think now we'll get into the blending side. So this beer, according to this, and you guys can elaborate from here. So it's a, uh, a amalgamation of rich dark beers with a big lactose infused, infused imperial stout aged for 10 months in Jim Beam bourbon barrels alongside a double mash imperial stout aged for six months in Widow Jane bourbon barrels. So that's what this is. Um, I'd love to hear what you like a bit more about it. And in... Like considering what what Max you just said before about like the the other adjuncts that you put it in after, the lactose was already in the beer before it went into the bourbon barrels. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Uh, because lactose um, is like the only maybe adjunct or ingredient that we put into the the the, the first day of the brew. Like, okay. Because it's part of it's part of the beer. And whenever, whenever we are talking about vanilla, cacao, uh, coffee, or whatever, mm. uh, we we do put it, uh, you know, later in the process. Maybe coffee is the only one that we are playing both sides, but uh, all the other ingredients goes further into the process. Gotcha. So the the blend the blendism one is like really just like beer and bourbon. This is what what the idea was was about like doing a, mm -hmm. a rich uh, a rich beer like a rich clean beer without anything else just trying to find out uh, the best you know the best uh, the, the more uh, the more complex notes that we could find 
uh, at this time in in the in the shit. Um, the the session was pretty fun. So uh, maybe Noah, you, you can talk more about your experience. But blending is is like this. This is what we are doing. Like for for sour beers, for clean beers. Uh, this is what we are doing. Like it was uh, yeah. it was a super fun exercise and like puts your it, it puts your palate and your mind to like this weird test where it, it's hard enough sometimes tasting multiple things that are similar and then being able to decipher between how much you like or dislike certain aspects but also by tasting them back to back it starts fucking with you as well and so max We, well, so we were, we were in the, the barrel room, and Max was, like, Spider-Manning it up, oh, like, along the fucking thing, and then he was, like, on ladders, and he had, and we, just taking, like, barrel after barrel, so, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, Max, but I think, you know, if you count each of us having a glass, we must have had a tray of, like, 40 or... I think it was, like, 20, yeah, 30 almost 30. Um, so, yeah, That's like, 15 lot. different barrels. Some of the barrels were the literally the same beer uh, and the same spirit, and then some things were drastically different and in different ages and stuff. And it was really interesting to kind of see how the same beer in the same spirit put into two different barrels can become something different. Mm. Um, meaning, like it's the it's like the same. Like, let's say, I don't know, Jim Beam barrel from the same year, but like times two, the exact same beer goes in at the exact same time, but then they come out different. Um, hmm. It just kind of shows the, I don't know, the art of it, I guess, or the, 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 the nature behind it a little bit, that it's like kind of mystical. Hmm. But the process was fun. And so we had all these glasses in front of us and... Yeah, I think originally, Max, we were, you know, in my head, we were going to be blending, like, I don't know, three or four, maybe even five different things to kind of create some mega beautiful blend. But in the end, there was really two standouts. And then when those two standouts were mixed together, it was just, like, perfection. And then every time we added anything else to it, it was still interesting, but less interesting than just of what those two uh, barrels did. So that's why in the end we just ended up blending those two because it was just the, the best possible beer we could have come up with. And, and I thought that was really cool, Max, because I thought part of you would have been like, no, no, let's, let's use some of the, <laughs> the other ones to like make a larger volume. But you were like so down with like, nope, this is the, the best combination. These two barrels, this is what we're doing. And like, Uh, it was cool. Interesting. Two questions. Did you have a goal in mind when you started blending? Did you have, like, obviously you knew you were doing a, a barrel age imperial stout, right? Like that you were going to blend. Uh, did you have a, there's a spider making a web I'm in a basement, in my basement now, and it's like fast. I'm just seeing it like drape, drape a car. I'm going to kill the motherfucker right after this, but Jesus Christ, man. <laughs> Relax. Um, <laughs> The di, well, for, you're I don't used to monster spiders where you live, so like yeah, this is like a joke. Yeah. But I do feel bad now. Like I know he's he's working right. He's like making a little thing, but it yeah, pissed me off. It's, leave him be, man. Well, it's in my set, and he's making it go down deep. Look how far down he's going. What are you doing, bro? Fuck. So <laughs> it's unacceptable. Um, it's blocking the Yeezys, man. I'm like shit. So the What are you okay. Doing? Bro. It's it's un it's unacceptable, you know. So, did you have a goal, as in, like, we want to achieve this, or was it just like, um, we want to do a stout? And then, secondly, uh, what was that? The spider distracted me. And maybe let, let's hit that one. Like, did you when when you're tasting? Because I guess if you don't have a goal, and you're b just fucking throwing things together, it's probably a little bit tough to kind of like come to a decision if you don't have like we want something that's as close to X. You know what I'm saying? Uh, how did that go? 
I think we we took it pretty um, loosely, and that like we had we had conversations about what, you know what possibilities were like. Let's do a collab with I don't know, just making like a, a regular beer or some kind of blend, and then I think scheduling wise, it made more sense to do a big stout or barley one, like that kind of thing. Um, so we decided on that and I don't think we talked about it too, too much. It's like, like, I think we both kind of knew, like there were a bunch of dark beers, high, high ABV dark beers and different types of spirits. Let's get together and make something great out of those. So that yeah, was like, so it was just something great. That was a, a what yeah. it was like. It wasn't like. We want the Jim Bean bourbon barrel. We wanted the lactose one. We wanted the double mash one. It was like, I don't know. Here's and Max, you just took fifteen different barrels and we're like, let's see what we like. Was it as simple as that? And it was a bit more open ended. Yeah, I think it's like when you you open up the fridge and you're like, okay, I have to make dinner. So what, <laughs> what do I got? Like, yeah, uh, it was basically the same exercise. That was uh, it was kind of like yeah. Like, I was like, okay, so for me, it was like a session where I could, you know, just uh, see where, where, you know, taste where the barrels were at. So it was an exercise of like tasting the whole dark side of the, you know, of the, of the barrel, the barrel room and try to make the best dark beer possible. Uh, if we had to put like porter into that beer, we, we, we will have put porter into that beer. So the, the, we just want to, to do the best dark beer possible at the moment and this is this is what we got like there 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 were cl clearly some barrels that were meant to to end up together at this time into the the barrel room and those are the two barrels that we used to because we try as noah said before we try with uh, different blends i think like f five different blends from yep. the, the the best beer we find out, and with uh, with like different percentage, and uh, sometimes it's it's like okay, let's use uh, forty percent of that one, forty percent of that one, then uh, uh, ten percent of this one, and ten percent of, th of this one, and okay, let's just uh, do twenty percent of this one, and then with the two others, uh, we just end up like blending two barrels together, 50-50, and it was like the best man we got at the moment because... That was my other question, 50-50, okay. Yeah, but sometimes you just sometimes you just put like 10% of another barrel into the, 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 the blend and it just changed the perception of the, you know, the, 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 the like the fruity note that you get or the, 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 the rose side or the, the, the you know when you taste like hazelnut some, somewhere and you just had the 10 percent of this one the hazelnut side just disappear and you're like okay wh where did it go it's like i just mm. had 10 percent of another beer into it and it just disappeared so it's all about you know um, threshold uh, because we all get thresholds and the, all the flavors that you get into beers uh have thresholds and sometimes you just deal with it with some things that ain't got that flavor and it just disappears or transform it to another um, another ar aroma so hmm. this is the, the whole exercise we, we did mm -hmm. and we, we end up with the, like a classic i mean like 50 50 but it was good really good so yeah. so this like is, this is what... i love that though i love that that's what it came down to for you guys was the simplicity. So I, I, like in the interest of the nature, what we're trying to get down to here. So like, what does it physically look like? So you've got 15 glasses. Do you have like one empty glass and you're like, all right, I take glass number one. I take a little bit. And I take glass number two and I take a little, like what's that pro or do you sip each one and be like, all right, well, number one is sweet and number two is really bitter and number three is this and blah, blah, blah. Then you like, you're like, well, what if we met, you mix number four and number 17? Like, like, how did that, how does it like actually like physically work? 
in the time when you guys are I sitting at the table. I think you actually table. just kind of nailed it. <laughs> really? I'm just, I've never seen honest. it, but okay. I know, I mean, but you could like, I mean, well, I mean, that's like, no, I mean, it was a little bit more structured because Max done it a few more times, uh, many more times than me, but it, it, I think we definitely tasted everything. And then I'm to get to like an overview of like, all right, this is what we yeah, have. I, be I believe so. Yeah, no, of course. And then, and then it was just kind of like subtle mixing having discussion right like oh number two and number four those were special but what about number five you know like just talking about it because you can't just do an endless stream of blend that was what right? i was thinking yeah you can't attack it mathematically you have to attack it by like oh i like this or i don't like this and okay so if you a few blends until you find okay so then if, if either of you guys were like Number five is just, I I I don't like number five. So then, do you just like take that out? Boom, that's gone. Is is it kind exactly. of because you're just trying to like cut it out? You 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 obviously don't want to be there for seven hours trying to get to a blend. So you're going to have to be a bit ruthless. Which is why I was asking before about what's the end goal, because it would help you rather than just see what's what you like. I imagine that it would. I mean, yeah, but I do get it too. But either way. Like cutting it out and then coming back to all right, cool. Well, we both really love number two right here. This is and you know, say like the Jim Beam one. You're just like, ah, oh, it's just obviously we want that barrel aged, that bourbon character. I know something that's important to Noah and that's really true to you and your brand. And then uh, and also the lactose, which is obviously very important to Noah. Loves lactose, team lactose all day, 2017. You know the vibes. Um, and then <laughs> you know, and then like sort of blending. So like. I'm just trying to picture the experience and trying to walk people through what the average, you know, general um, blending procedure would look like. Um, yeah, is there any more context or anything else? Like, did you just sort of like, well, we only like those two? Because, like, say if you pick five that you liked, how do you know what ratios to do them in? Do you just put equal amounts of each in a glass and then see how that goes? You're like, you know what? Let's put 10% of this. Like, how, how does that even go? Because that just seems like it can get very complicated. Well, yeah, at Max, I uh, think, say his bill. I think we, we, did, uh, we did two tasks uh, in the one session. I mean, uh, mo most of the time I will have, you know, taste the, uh, the, the whole uh, barrel, you know, a barrel room like a month ago or two weeks before the, the session. So uh, we will have you no know, discard easily some barrels and then focus on like uh, forty percent of the barrels. Uh, but at this time, I think we, we just do both in the same session for the the, the blendism. Uh, but and it was pretty pretty easy for us because uh, we you know we we just when when you taste the barrel, you just go direct to the point like medium body, light body, like full tannin, uh, full alcohol, like fruity notes, uh, intense uh, nutty notes. Uh, you just write it like in, in, into a sentence and then after you, you pass all those barrels, you just come back to, okay, yeah, I did appreciate the, the 173 and the 174. Uh, okay, the, this one is made, the 173. The barrel 174 is made with Jim Beam, and the 173 is like made with uh, Widow Jane. And you're like, okay, uh, I like the body of this one, I like the aromas of this one. So mm. you just try something from it. I mean, you you, you try to, um, to 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 imagine the beer, and from the notes, and then you have something to start with because. Uh, you could go crazy, like, uh, at first, like, uh, okay, I could do, like, 30% of this one, uh, 20, 25% uh, of this one, and then, uh, and, and then end up with, like, four different barrels, but uh, this is not how you you start, I think. I think you start, like, simple, and then you, ha you add complexity to it, if you want. Ooh. So, like, it's almost like better to start with. Yeah, go on, Noah, sorry. No, sorry. I was just gonna say, like, and one thing, and 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 actually, you have a lot of experience with this, Craig, in terms of like 
tasting a bunch of stuff can be really humbling sometimes because really the you know like if 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 you if you just get one beer put in front of you you can be like I very much enjoy that or I very much don't enjoy that or whatever but when you have all a bunch of things in front of you that are similar and you're comparing you, you start like questioning your own thought process like so it can get really intimidating at times and humbling mm -hmm. but I think we were both like for me it, it was very clear the ones that made sense and some of them I think we both even agreed like who knows what what's going to happen to this barrel but many of them were still good they just weren't either ready yet or you know let's like kind of like let's see where they evolve to over time mm. but there was just two that really just hit it and in terms of like what, what this beer actually tastes like uh yeah, what i liked about, about it, it yeah, it's, it's it's continuing to evolve uh a lot it's i feel, I feel like it's it's a different beer almost now to a certain degree hmm. not like in a bad way but it's just i feel like it keeps changing but i remember even in the moment one thing that i appreciated about it is that it almost felt like it was like marrying a few different um styles of barrel aged stout in the in the sense that like it has like a a slight bourbon county thing which is that like old school super rich bourbon barrel aged imperial imperial stout but then it has like that double mash component contemporary thing with the lactose that has that like <clears throat> slight slight pastry thing but not really mm. and then um i feel like I, I think it's the jim bean it lends this like spicy bourbon note that's a bit different than that like classic chocolatey vanilla thing um so it's like i feel like it's a bit frankenstein-y and uh in a good way uh hmm. it's like hits different time periods a little bit hmm. that's a cool description it's uh we grew up I don't want to say growing up, that's a weird thing to say, drinking Jim Beam. Like, my parents drank it that when I first started drinking, that's what we were drinking. Um, it was like Jim Beam and Coke was like the shit back in my day. So I was, I'm always happy to see that. I don't know why, just for like a throwback, but I never really like, I don't drink it. I don't really drink liquor much. So like, I didn't, I, I put that together. So it was really cool to hear that, Noah, like the, the, the element specific element of Jim Beam that is different to you know obviously a lot of uh, bourbon barrel aged stouts are like Heaven Hill or something like that like you know Jim Beam isn't something I see a lot so I, I thought that was a really cool unique thing. Um, the this beer is I can see what you mean. It's got a bit of the like the the lactose is definitely the new, but it's not like a new school thing. But it's not very it's not like overly sweet or anything. Um, it's surprisingly no. and dangerously drinkable for eleven percent. Um, the the nose is that beautiful chocolatey, like bourbony, warming, boozy thing. It's not too much, but it's it's. I think you guys really nailed it. Um, I did want to see. So you you mentioned that there was always these two barrels that you kept coming back to. Is that? I mean, maybe Noah, you might not have as many thoughts on this, but. Like, is that a normal thing? So you're doing a blending session. Is there usually something that stands out that it's usually like, oh, well, this is what I'm looking for right now. Like, is it pretty obvious? Or do you sometimes, are there sessions where you're like, oh, fuck, like, I don't even know what to do here. I think I'm going to have to just leave it for now and come back in a month or something. Like, is there, is there any commonalities between anything like that? Uh, most of the time, we know... Um... We try to, to keep track of the time, to know where we are at. So um, a tasting session must be like every, every two months or three months. Okay. And then you, you do it and you know, okay, the, this one, you know, is almost there or this one is right there. So we, we had to put, Use put, it. Pull, uh, put it out of the barrels uh, the next month or the next two months because we don't want to gain more more complexity or more uh, more tannins or that kind of stuff so uh, when we do tasting session we do it um, once every like two or three months hmm. because it's not that that stressful you know uh, 
but you have to keep track of of the time and most most of the time we did we did taste in our session like young barrels that uh, i i would not have really taste but it was a good example of like fresh beer that that is that set into the barrel for like two months and those those beer base beers were really like fresh and rough so you know that you won't get much of of the barrels because um the the, the beer was just there for like two months and you know you don't you don't really waste your time tasting it because uh, you you won't get you know much complexity from from the wood and from the the bourbon barrel mm. but when when you you start being at the peak of like uh, five to six months you you're getting interest into your barrel like okay maybe I, I will taste it and you know uh, to know where we are at like is is it the type of barrel that I will let it for like six other months or is it ready in like one or two months i think so mm. sometimes a possibility so this is why you, you want to to keep uh, keep track of of, uh, of of kind of a timeline and we are talking about uh, about clean beer right now because if we we take the if we take the the, the wild beers uh within six months if it's something like uh, you you guys uh you guys have uh, t we talked about chiffre d'or uh, earlier mm. uh, this beer uh, this that beer has been like two years and a half uh for being bottled and sit there for like six months and if i taste the, the base beer for like the, the first 18 months it tastes like shit sometimes <laughs> <laughs> mm. Really, sometimes it tastes like rubber, like band-aid, like kind of stuff. But you know, that's sulfur, this, I this guess. Part. Yeah, but this is kind of part of the process. This is where mm -hmm. you know, the, the 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 wild side is more complex and, and and take a lot of a lot of time because you have a lot of bacteria, bacterias, and one. Uh, one of uh, the, the yeast, uh, the wild yeast or the bacteria take a nutriment and then eat it and then produce something that tastes like rubber. So it, tastes, it doesn't taste good at, at six months or like 12 months. And then after that, there's another bacteria that just eat it right away and it tastes like pineapple right now. So this is kind of funky because uh, this kind of nice. symbiose takes it really takes a lot of time and this one took like basically two years to to start being really interesting mm. so we just let it ride we know that we knew that we we could have something uh something interesting from it but the first 12 months were really not interesting at all and <laughs> sometimes you taste it and you're like oh shit, why am i doing it because this is <laughs> awful man <laughs> And sometimes you just you, you just smell it and you're like, okay, no, uh, I don't taste it or did it right a little bit. <laughs> but time. for 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 the for the clean beers, it doesn't happen if because if it's not appealing, when you you smell it the first month, you, you you've got a problem right away. Okay. But uh, the, the 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 biggest problem you can have is like uh, even. If the beer is not good or infected, you will know it, or the beer will not, you know, will not be ready. You know, you, you won't get much from the barrel, and then you just let it right into the barrel for a couple of months and hope for a, uh, for a biggest flavor the next time you taste it. And mm. when we're doing like clean beers, uh, you you want uh, freshly emptied barrels because if you got a barrel that were emptied like three months ago, four months ago, the spirits would just like the 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 the, the spirit into it would would just you know evaporate and you won't you won't get much flavor. So mm -hmm. that's this gonna be is why you want the huh. most freshly emptied barrel possible. Uh, you you like it when there's a there's a little bit of like bourbon. At the uh, at the bottom of the the barrel when you, you receive it 
And so this is a good sign. Hmm. Interesting. So is there a different approach to blending for different styles? Like the wild versus the clean? Like is there a different approach at all or is basically the same thing? Like if you're making this shift or like the, which is like you said, like a, how would you describe this? What, what would you call this? Just a wild ale, farmhouse ale? Uh, this one is more the Lambic like we did. Lambic. Okay. Uh, uh, this one got like, uh, I think it's 40% of, uh, a blend we did with, um, so, okay, sometimes we drag yeast from the bottle we, we, we are drinking. And this one is a blend of uh, Trifontenin and uh, Boone. Uh, those two uh, those are two Belgian uh, That's cool. uh, no uh, yeast producers. And it got like 20% of our own culture of like commercial yeast that we used to work with time. But it's like uh, a blend we, we did like a couple of years ago. Uh, so we just bought like uh, Pedococcus, like the best loose, and then Bay and, uh, and then uh, yeast from uh, from this uh, this yeast producer and put them together. And we end up with uh, our own blend. Hmm. And Chiffre d'Or that, that, uh, that you show us uh, is like 40% of like uh, drag bone culture. Uh, and forty percent of Trifontenin uh, drag culture, and twenty percent of our own culture. But mm. it took like two years and a half before uh, being bottled, and then they they set uh, you know it sat there for like six months, and we end up selling it after three years. So this is more like a complex. Uh, earlier we talked about Girzet that take like uh, maybe three months into barrels. Uh, but this is a whole different project because yeah. uh, it took time and then a lot of attention and a lot of patience. So it's hmm. more the I'm, I'm I'm really proud of this one because this is the more lambic uh, lambic like uh, that we did. Even if it's not spontaneous, we try some spontaneous beer, but this one is not sp spontaneous at all. But it's the more like Belgian lambic like beer that we produce. Very cool, man. So there is it's like awesome. I, it sounds like there's a slightly different approach, maybe then, to the different sides. Like you don't just pull yeah. fifteen barrels and fifteen. Like it's probably a little. It almost seems like it's like with the cleaner stuff, it can maybe go either way. But with maybe the wild stuff, there's a little more intention behind it because you can't just throw. Yeah, let's just fucking put all this. Like, if you're trying to make this lambic style thing, it's a very intentional product, versus the the Clemence, which is the Grisette. It's a, it's like, it's almost like the style would dictate because you can only combine beers that are Grisettes, I guess, to make a yeah. Grisette, and and then so it's probably slightly different. I think it also probably has a lot to do with the brewery. And like okay. your situation, right? Like so, you know, Bert, like like Goose Island probably has just like thousands rows and fucking rows, and like they <laughs> probably have this very like 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 systematic thing because they've been doing it for so long, and now they have money behind it. But you know, like I feel like what me and Max did was a bit more just agile, right? Like this is what we have. Let's see what we can do, you know. But if yeah, you look at like. Uh... Lambic Size matters, guys. Like, what's that? <laughs> I said, "Size matter, guys." <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> it's not how you use it. Really, it's really small, so we we're doing the best we can. <laughs> and if, if we can, we are compared to the Goose Island, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just a little bit. Mean, we just have, uh, you know, of the competition. I mean, they they've got, I mean, a whole level of barrels and program. But this is a good point because we do, you know, we do with the space we got. So uh, mm -hmm. this is why for us it's like a, a challenge to do the beer twice uh, mm -hmm. sometimes because I often see uh, the, the, the beer that we produce as a flavor project. So it's not like uh, I want to do it like 
twice or uh, three times a year because this is a whole different level of, of challenge. We, we try to do uh, calculon a second time, uh, I mean, last year or this year, and the, the, the flavors were, were not there. So we just change up, you know, the, 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 the barrels. They were good, but they were not like uh, like the, 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 the in, in in the in the vibe of the calculon uh, the first batch. Mm -hmm. So we just redefine what what we the, we had to do with the barrels. And this is <clears throat> this is a you know a good a good example of uh, doing the, the same beer twice in, in blending. Uh, it's it's really difficult when you you don't have that much barrels. And when when you especially especially when you blend, uh, I think wild wild beers, uh, because you know that this beer will uh, will evolve through time through the, the bottling process because you, you just don't put like uh, carbon dioxide into the into the beer and then it, it end up being ready like the day after. You, you put sugar you uh, into the beer and you you let it ride for like six months and then you put a label on it and then you you set it on the market but when you blend sour beers uh, it's I think it's more difficult because uh, you have to um, you are at a point into the process and you are doing the blend and after that the beer will, work uh, will continue to work into the bottle and then after that people will will you know will buy it and, and will consume it so you you are like six months earlier before the beer is ready so this is the, the biggest challenge because you try to know um, which type of flavor which type of uh, acidity which type of you know uh, uh, body you will get from the the fermentation because it's it's kind of uh, you you have active yeast and active bacteria and you just put some nutrients into it and you, you know that even if the blend you are doing right now you get the body you get you know the the, the, the flavors but not that much of the funk but you know that in bottles it will get the funk mm. the, a bit more of acidity so you have to work uh, you know, uh, before before the beer is ready. So, mm. you mentioned, uh, and I, I'm glad you brought it back up. Like recreating the same beer. So, like, like you said about Calculon, you sort of it might not have necessarily worked out. But like, is it technically possible to re to have like a brand of um, of uh, a barrel aged beer that you do regularly? Uh, that you can continually recreate. Well, not even just barrel aged, particularly blended beer. I guess is what we're talking about here. Um, yeah, is it possible? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think it's possible. Uh, and uh, we we did it with with Clemence, which is more fresh. But I think that the second batch is pretty much like the, the first one. Maybe a little bit more fruity, but it's really like a, a, we 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 could compare the two like fresh. I think those are really similar, really similar. And we, we did rebrew some some of the beer we blend before, but uh, right now, you know, those beer are in bottles, and you know, I can I can say right now because they they just been put into bottles, and uh, in like four to six months, I will be able to, to tell you that I'm really proud of the second blend that we did, but. It's, it's definitely something that we can do because if you think about the gueuserie like uh, Tilkain, which is uh, which you taste the, the Tilkain and Gueuse blend uh, 2000 size uh, or the two, 2021, you know, it will be really similar and they are practically based on blending stock. So mm. they just build up their stock to blend something that is similar year after year and then they create some other stuff on the side, but they are able to, you know, to, to blend something that is similar year after year. So yeah, it's possible, uh, but you have to get like, uh, if you, like I said before, like uh, if you got an empty fr uh, fridge, like 
you can do whatever you want but if you you just went to the grocery store i mean it's it's really easy to do like whatever the recipe you want to do for the supper it's like the mm. same thing but with barrels i get it man and i guess that's why a lot of uh, breweries will have that year like here's our 2022 blend here's our 2021 blend uh, of different things so that it can be like this is what we did this year to try and recreate it and it might not be exactly the same but it's like you said from the same stock it's from the same batch of barrels we've done our best to recreate it and that's sort of all you can really do and maybe the beauty of it all is that it's imperfect it's not exactly, exactly. The same. and it keeps this it is interesting beer, man. this is why yeah. we, we like it man. it's craft yeah. beer I mean, it's not like, like if yeah, and it's yep. not like Budweiser. Like we, we don't, you know, we don't dilute. We don't have you know, like four uh, different think... fermenter of the same beer. Try to to make the, the same one, but like craft beer is mostly mostly that. I mean, it's it's a flavor project, and we're trying to do the same thing, you know, every yeah, time. Right. But in, it ends up different a little bit, and it's it's cool like that. What were you going to say now? I remember Sean from Small Pony talking oh, about um, like the, the the first four beers that they released. One of them was this beer that the barrel gave off such an orange flavor mm-hmm. that they just dry hopped it with like mosaic or something to like punch up that oranginess and he was never able to like reproduce that beer because like that one barrel just had this weird orange thing. amazing orange thing. Is that on the pod we but did? I think he talked about it a bit on the pod, yeah. Okay. Um I don't think we, we didn't drink it on the pod, but uh, no, no, no. but he we... talked about it I think. And but so like I would imagine you have these like kind of one off situations, but mm-hmm. then on the other hand I assume that breweries just kind of like, if they've done the same beer and blend or whatever a couple of times, then they've probably gotten a little bit better at being more systematic with it. Like Dunham has done like uh, Saison Reserve and like Assemblage Numéro 1 at least like 20 times. And those are weird blends of like a saison in a particular barrel with wild yeast blended with like one of their IPAs or what like they're they're all different but that beer always kind of manages to be the same even though it's a combination of blending and barrel aging and I think they do a good job with it Mm. and then of course like Rodenbach and all those Mm -hmm. those are all blends right and like that it they definitely turn that into a system yeah that's a really good point actually uh you know road and Bucks being around we had them on the podcast funnily enough and they were you know 200 year old brewery or something like that so you know it seems like there is a way to do it and i like coming back to what you said about say small pony i imagine max you probably have had that too where you've had this one barrel in this one year of something that's just like what the fuck it's a completely unique in comparison to other years and i feel like like you said it's craft beer so that the, mm-hmm. the consumers are well aware of that and aren't, you know, they, they're they happy that this, hey, this 2022 version of this beer is pretty fun. It's pretty unique. And maybe next year is going to be completely different, even though you, like, you're trying to be systematic. You're trying to use the same stuff. Um, somewhat kind of like wine. It depends on the harvest. Like, you know, you, you do each year the same wine. Wineries make the same wine, but just with exactly. grapes that had different uh, physical conditions. And it's probably not too dissimilar. I, I think a lot of wines don't have blends. If it's a Pinot or a Cab Franc or a Cab Sauv, whatever it might be, it's a straight up and down because it requires the grapes. But with beer... It's, it's, you know, there's a blend. There are some wines that I guess that have blends, but I guess those, you know, that particular combination of those barrels that happen to respond in that way are what make this thing fun because there's an, there's a beauty in the consistency in a McDonald's kind of way where if you can pump out 
the same beer time after time uh, and you know what it's going to taste like, that's pretty cool. But at the same token, sure. this is the Wild West, pun intended. Like this type of shit, this shift door, the next time you do it, it might be completely different to, to, to the last time. And that's fucking cool because I can, like, I did my first ever vertical with Noah on the podcast in 2017, and you brought over the um, what was it called, bro? The um, the dark neutral, exactly from Judas CL. We did like four of them, and you said, "Oh, I could have done more, but you know, you had to drive, so you were like, right, I can't do too many more." But like, it was cool to me to understand that like this is this beer each year, and it's different. Every one of them was different. And that's pretty, like, that's just the dope thing that we have in craft beer, whether it's a, a clean, straight up and down beer or something fun like what BG is doing with these, you know, really dope, complex, thoughtful um, barrel aged beers, you know, whether wild or clean. It's, it's like a, it's probably one of the things that make beer the most interesting beverage. Yeah, if you are taking like a uh, oval in example, you know, with uh, framboise or. Uh... Mm. Like every every year, they're doing like what one batch of that type of beer, and this is the edition of the year, and so it's really fun to compare uh, between years. Uh, even you know if the, the the older version, you know sometimes they, they, they get less fruity uh, fruity aromas, but it, it's really fun to compare every year the difference between the last year. And on the on the less uh, sexy side, I mean, uh, like the bigger breweries, they they, they still are, they are blending like their basic beers too, and uh, like even Barreal, you know, the the famous Barreal Hus is is blended. Like I mean, they they got like full fermenters really? of uh, Barreal Barreal Hus, and they are like blending it for for like uh, because it, it must taste. It has to taste the same. The same, so, right? And we, we are working with with grain, uh, with different type of grain and the different low uh, lots of, of grain. So it, it have you know every brew have have its specific difference. I could say. So if you brew four times in a row, you know you you will be more able. To uh to have the same exact beer at the end, but if you brew it like once, this is like the beer you got. You 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 get less control if you brew it like once, or you brew it like four times in a row to to brew like a full fermenter, and even after that, if you get like two fermenters of which contains like eight brews, you can. Brew, uh, you can bottle like the full one with the half of this one and then the beer will end up being like the almost exact same beer as mm. it was commercialized like 20 years ago so mm. so the more you brew the more you have like uh, the power of being consistent I think mm. that's uh that's wise words Maxwell Wise words, so this, think, this is yeah. blending. This is blending too, but on the on the different scale and uh, maybe on the less uh, left crafty side of the beer. But mm. this is something that is happening. I think I have a little one awake, so I might need to drop. No, you're good. Look, I was about to wrap it up anyway. Uh, I feel like we've uh, we hit the time limit we wanted to, and I feel like we really sort of captured. Um, what we wanted to do. Noah, if you do have to run, let's just take the screenshot real quick and then if you want to dip out, you can yeah, sure. Um So let me hold these bad boys up. This is great, guys. This is really cool. This is exactly what uh, I wanted yeah. to get out of this was just to really get get nerdy, you know? Get deep and get nerdy. I, I miss you, Mac. I want to come visit you. What about me, Noah? Fuck you. Ready? I'm actually thinking... Oh, anyway. Hey, wait, what's that? Hey, yeah. Gorgeous. Um, I actually had an idea of coming to see you in the next couple of months, but I'll talk to you about it. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I, if you're around. I'm around. I'm not going anywhere. Um, you're both uh, legends. Love you both, guys. Thank you so much for this. This is really great. 
I feel like this was like a, a really interesting um, pod, and um, you know, I feel like I hope that people got a bit more of a, a, an insight into the world of blending and sort of you know how complex it can be and how interesting you know these beers and when you're drinking these beers and when you see the price tag on some of these beers, that's why they've been sitting there, they've been painstakingly. Yeah. Uh, blended and, and put together and it might be a combination that you never get again and that's why it's special and you know that's what kind of makes this whole thing very interesting so thank you both for taking the time to do this and um i love it i definitely want to see a blendism part two um I would love that. Uh, noah where can everyone find you online my friend um beerism.ca on instagram the website and uh, on facebook as well Love it. You're and a in my apartment. And in Noah's apartment and on Tinder, Bumble, Hinge, and Grinder. And uh, Max, where can everyone find BG? Yeah, thanks for, uh, for the invite. It's always a pleasure, guys. And see you uh, see you again. Where can they find Quebec you? Or yes. wherever you are. Yes. And Come to Quebec people City. Can find us uh, on Instagram or on Facebook, BG Brasseur Ben. Wow. Uh, I love. I miss the wasa so I'm not gonna lie. I miss that a lot. Um, bring it Octo- back. I'm bringing it on back. I'm representing it here in Ontario. Uh, Max, October twenty second. Twenty second, yeah, on Saturday night. Uh, the, the full day. Uh, we had a special release, and it's our ninth uh, ninth anniversary. So you know, people can have to came to come with like the, their kids during the day and there's a show during the night and 16 beers on draft and a special release and you know this will be the big the the big party in quebec so get down october 22 october 22nd guys make sure you get down quebec city uh the Charlesburg brewery specifically exactly yeah wow perfect um, guys, stick what I was about to say, what some more, what um, stick around at the end. We'll just quickly say goodbye. I know you got a jet, Noah, but uh, guys, thank you both so much for uh, hanging out tonight, guys. If you enjoyed the episode, smash the thumbs up, hit subscribe below, hit the notification bell so you know when the new drops. Follow us everywhere at BAOS Podcast. Check the long form audio, you can hear attractive gentlemen like Max and Noah talk about craft beer. Hit those five stars on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Um, Guys, we'll see you in the next episode. Peace.